we start then? Where's the camera? I don't even know where I'm supposed to be looking here. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, well, that, that feels weird to do. Uh, I'm not going to do that, but I'm Tyler Shores. Um, I manage the Think Lab program here at the University of Cambridge, and we host a number of events that we'd like to do for public, both um, uh, online and in person as part of our uh, university community and for anyone else that would like to join us. So today on uh, February 14th, we've got Marcella Starkoff talking about the joy of not knowing. So um, I first met Marcelo from a, a talk he gave at the uh, Faculty of Education. Um, and uh, he's had a long career in education as a head teacher, as a researcher. Uh, lovely website too, uh, J-O-N-K Learning dot co dot uk right that's correct yeah yes. so that there's more information on that which i find very helpful and loaded with useful resources and things um uh on the slide hopefully everyone can see the slides um and everything but there's the uh the website uh, marcel is also uh, quite active on social media so um i follow him on linkedin and uh, twitter so feel free to do the same uh he'll make this very interactive and we'll make sure that we have time for your questions or comments and thoughts after this so I think I'm going to turn it over to you. So the floor is yours. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Tyler. And um, thank you for everyone that's uh, joined uh, online. And thank you for the people here. And thank you so much, Tyler, for the invitation to speak at the Think Lab in Cambridge. It's a real, real dream come true. It's fabulous to have uh, to have met and to have kept this connection over the, the years and to follow the exciting things that the Think Lab is doing. To be here, you won't, I don't know if you can see, but to be here at the Oriel Room uh, in the Pitt Building in Cambridge is, is such an amazing honour and privilege. Um, so, Very pretty room. Wish you could be here in person. Yes, thank you so, so much. Um, uh, yes, so I'm Marcelo Starikov. I'm currently a lecturer at the University of Sussex and uh, 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 joint lead of the primary BA and early years course um, at Sussex. Um, and that is, um, I've been there for, the, uh, for three years now. And previously to that, uh, I've come, as Tyler said, from a career in uh, primary education as a primary teacher um, and Oh, thank you. That yeah, that's really good. Yeah, that's much better. Yeah, um, that's much better. Thank you. Uh, as a primary teacher and until recently uh, as a primary head teacher. And during that time um, in, uh, in education and primary teaching, I have been developing a kind of a philosophy of education and then of school leadership that has now become known as the joy uh, of not knowing. And I, move, uh, uh, I guess what underpins the, the title, the phrase, the phraseology, and the, um, uh, the, the culture that the Joe of Not Knowing instills is the concept that in order to learn something new, uh, we have to not know it first. And it's a really transformational um, idea to present to children from, from very from very early on, <clears throat> from very early on. And what I have found it does is that it makes children or students or adults, anyone, just uh, completely transform their view and perspective of when they find themselves in situations of not knowing and in situations of uncertainty. So uh, what, I, what I've been developing are the, the kind of techniques and cultures that we need to develop in, in learning environments that enable uh, students and children from a very young age to not, you know, to completely change the way they perceive being in a position of not knowing and rather than feel worried uh, or feel that it's, uh, it's, it's something that's, um, uh, that's a sort of very negative and something that stops and prevents them from launching into the learning and uh, to, to engaging with the learning in the first place is actually something that by definition, we all must be at if we're going to try and learn something new. So when the children start to realize that uh, in order to learn something new, we actually have to not know it first, then what's really exciting is to create those conditions uh, that enable the children to feel really enthusiastic 
about not knowing because then they start to realize that that is their only opportunity to be able to learn something new. And it's, it's really interesting because um, emotionally, we always feel much better when we are certain when we know the answer. So if you, if you do children or, or students, if you ask a question, they, they really would, you know, they feel much better if they put their hand up and they know the answer. So emotionally, we feel better. So what I started to realize um, very early on in education is that the, the mere process of uh, having to learn places the learner in a, in a very, in an emotionally uncomfortable position. Uh, so the whole book, the whole philosophy, the whole idea that underpins the joy of not knowing is that it tries to make students comfortable with being uncomfortable because we can't deny the fact that we are going to be feeling uncomfortable when we're faced with something new, when we're faced with uncertainty, when we're faced with things that we don't know. Um, so that's the kind of essence of um, what... Um, uh, what led to the kind of over time the um, the development of the of the theory and philosophy that's now known as uh, the joy of not knowing. And I guess the the whole principle, which is really interesting, came from the fact that before primary education, I was actually a scientist. Um, so I did a PhD at the London Hospital, looking at liver cells, and then I did a postdoc in Bristol looking at red blood cells. And I guess when I came into education then, into primary school teaching, I came in with that sense of uh, thinking like a scientist. And that's what I really wanted to impart on children. Because if you think about the life of a research scientist, every single day they go into work, they go into the lab, they, they, they go and, and present themselves purposely in a position of not knowing of trying to find things out, of that's what research is all about. But not only the, of not knowing themselves and the teacher knowing, but the scientist places themselves in a position of not knowing where nobody in the world knows the answer to. So it's a really interesting uh, concept to have um, and to share with, with the children that um, if we start to think like a scientist, you start to embrace be in a position uh, of not knowing because you are then enthusiastic to really want to know and to find things out and you and to then contribute new knowledge to um uh, to what i call sort of cultural capital uh, the essence of linking education to uh, the you know linking the purpose of education for a very young age to the acquisition of knowledge but then as we'll see today, to the understanding of what that knowledge means. But also what I'm really keen to share with you today is that I want to go beyond knowledge and understanding and then move to wisdom. So the, the knowledge to understand into wisdom is what also what really underpins um, the jar of not knowing approach. So all these kind of thoughts and theories um, when they come together in the classroom are so incredibly magical uh, or in any um, uh, or, or at any time that we are learning anything new. Um, and, um, and it's just something that uh, I am delighted to be able to, uh, to share with yourselves uh, today. But, um, and, and I'll share it with you today through a series of provocations because as you'll see, um, the whole aspect of just, as you can see, just by looking at the, at the title of Joe Not Knowing and how that is able to unlock uh, the, the learning potential of, of students, is really exciting because it, it, it starts to, it, it's, it focuses on, on certain aspects that are counterintuitive to what we normally expect. And that's what I really enjoy, that kind of provocation and thinking about things differently. And um, and particularly in how the, in in how this approach and how creating this culture removes the fear and worry associate usually associated with not knowing. So that's that's what um, that's kind of 
the, the how it all um, emerged. But before we start, what I'd love to do is to get a real consensus of what we all um, kind of think about when we think about education. I've got a little exercise just for us to do it within a couple of minutes where um, it's, this is a, uh, an example of a thinking skills starter, uh, which is something that uh, we'll be covering later on in the presentation, which is something that the children in school come into every morning. So they come into a, an open-ended challenge that enables them all to engage as soon as they come into the classroom in something that they enjoy and they can all succeed at. Um, and this is part of the, the other concept that I wanted to discuss with you today and introduce to you today, which is the concept of this metacognition. I'm sure you're all familiar with metacognition, um, but recently I've realized that there was a need for something that was kind of the the opposite of metacognition in within the learning process. And that's what I was discussing with Tyler that I felt so excited uh, about to share with you today. The kind of concept of when we are learning without realizing that we're learning. And I think that's probably when the best learning happens. And I wanted to give it a term. So I just thought, you know, with metacognition, you're really, you're consciously always thinking about how well your learning is going. You're thinking about what you know, what you're going to learn next. You're kind of, you're kind of thinking about your um, that that you the what you're learning all the time. With this metacognition, uh, I wanted to express a way in which we are learning without really realizing that we're learning. And if you are uh, uh, aware of um, uh, early years practice, it kind of tends to mimic the way that early years children learn. So they learn in an environment, but they, and that's where the best learning happens, and they don't realize that they're learning. It's that kind of concept, but we'll unpick that uh, in, in a second. So um, can we create very quickly an A to Z of education? So anything at all that associate, yeah, you associate uh, online or here, with uh, with education, starting with any letter of the alphabet, um, and just call it. Can can the contributions from online be picked up? Sure. Um, uh, can they talk to us? Um, yes, anyone can. Matt, mute. Can you write them on the chat. Feel free to call out uh, online or Matt, or write them on the chat. And I see. Thank you so much for joining. I see lots of our international friends have joined. Uh, from India. So very, very warm welcome. We have a very um, wonderful group from India that are uh, very, very keen on the job of not knowing and are kind of just developing their whole philosophy of education around it. Thank you for joining uh, uh, Vidya Sanjay Rajin. It's lovely to see you. So yeah, anything at all, A to Z of education. So we get a kind of baseline of what we all think about when we think about education awareness awareness that's amazing Simone. brilliant awareness i love it also social media as well that is brilliant awareness of but so there's awareness of the whole isn't it? awareness of where we are awareness of where we're learning awareness of what we've been taught i love it brilliant uh, humanity i love it we've got curiosity Humanity, that is so wonderful. See, to start like this, linking education with these values, with these thoughts, with these ideas, is exactly what the whole of the principle that underpins the job not knowing is, is all about. It's just creating the conditions which children associate being, being at school, going through a process of learning, but always totally linked with their real lives. With and then with everything that's happening, so it's that global aspect of what education does for us. Is there anything, Tyler? We've got a good question here from Andy. Uh, yes. First, I guess before we answer the question, your question: Whose purpose? Whose purpose of education? Whose purpose? Brilliant. So purpose. I'm, I'm amazing. Okay, we'll turn that into an answer. <laughs> That is brilliant. Mind is change. Marshall, Marshall, mind change. change. Brilliant. Thank you. Change. Education is the way to change our world. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much. Was that video? Wonderful. Training. Training. 
Wonderful. Experience. Experience, yes. That is so, these are such key words. Marcella has added empowerment also. Again. Empowerment, got two of these, brilliant. Empowerment, absolutely fantastic, brilliant. Brilliant, can we add John on Jay? Jay always has to be for John. <laughs> brilliant, anything else? Any other quick ones? Any other thoughts? Knowledge, yep. yes. brilliant, absolutely. Expression. Knowledge and expression, yes, brilliant, brilliant. So that's just an idea. You can see already how um, uplift one says that's lovely, Regina, brilliant, uplift. And Sue brilliant. says questioning. Brilliant. Emotional uplift, and I hope that this is what we, this is what's been portrayed today. The uplift is, is amazing, brilliant. Um, so you can see already how you know, if you launch the day with something like this, how the, com the conversation in the classroom, how the children all feel they've succeeded, everyone has contributed. It's just, it's one of those examples of this metacognition. They are learning, they're feeling emotionally um, really in, in a great place, but without realizing that they've, that that they're learning, you know, it's, it's, it's just wonderful. So um, that's brilliant. So this takes us on to discussing our four uh, provocations for today. And it's so interesting when I was compiling this to think uh -huh. that these four statements really underpin the philosophy of the Joe of Not Known, but also underpin things that have, um, I don't know if you can see in front, but things that have led to such incredible unlocking of children's learning and children's potential. And what I love about this, these provocations is that they lead to the unlocking of potential, not by the teacher, but by the intrinsic motivation of the students. And that is when I have found that the most magical moments happen. It's when the, 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 the learning is presented and then the student takes takes it intrinsically to levels and moments and outcomes that were never expected and way beyond what's traditionally known as the learning objective. So it's opening up the capacity for, uh, for learning, for engagement and for adding that personal value by every student that I find really, really fascinating. Um, so these four provocations, um, I, I don't know if we can, um, it's, it's too much to go into breakout rooms, but um, one, the first one is that it's brilliant to not know. Um, so I say that to the children all the time and they absolutely, first of all, they find it hilarious, but they absolutely love it. And it's such a, a way of making them feel so comfortable with, uh, with uncertainty from an early age that it's fantastic because you then explain to them that in order to learn something new, we must not know it first. And that's something that is, is, is it sounds obvious, but it's never, it's not usually um, discussed with the children so explicitly, so that it becomes so, so apparent. So that's one of the things that I wanted us to discuss. The other one is, uh, comes, originated from a quote by, um, a quote, a wonderful quote by Albert Einstein, when which he said that he never taught his students, he just provided the conditions in which they could learn. Um, and um, I think that's a really, really interesting concept and one that has really driven uh, my whole approach uh, uh, throughout, uh, throughout my time um, in education. So that's, that's a, a really interesting um, uh, thing to consider uh, when we are, when we are talking about the conditions needed to be able to be an effective uh, learner. Best learning happens when students don't realize that they're learning. Um, these are all provocations and I would love to hear your thoughts, your, you know, your, your ideas and your, um, uh, your, your to kind of the way that you, that you view these uh, as well. So please feel free to um, uh, to be formulating your thinking as we go through them. Uh, for learners to be engaged, the teaching must be offered in more than the language of instruction and the culture of instruction. And I think that is a really, really fascinating concept that 
Um, it's closest the book is chapter 11, and it's uh, the concept of uh, multilingual thinking in multicultural classrooms. And the idea is that um, I feel that it's so transformational to embrace the the whole richness of language and culture that every individual brings with them as soon as they walk through the door. And rather than just limiting the learning and the experience to the language and culture of instruction. So we will look at all these four in detail, but I just wanted to give you a couple of minutes to think about these and to see if there are if there are any kind of immediate thoughts or uh, any things that you want to add to any of these uh, provocations? Is there anything that springs to mind? Anything that they prompt? Any questions? Any ideas? And then we'll go through each one at a time, uh, illustrating it with examples of, of them in practice. I have a slightly different example. Um, this, this, I think this fits, but especially for number three, when the best learning happens, and I guess I'll broaden it out to all of us when you know we don't realize there's learning happening. Where's that coming from? Um, uh, so at least looking back on it, I think in terms of I've had rough start to the week, a couple of like awful, god awful meetings to start the week. Yes. But I try to use that as a learning experience too when I can distance a little bit yes. in terms of like, all right, so when I separate a little bit from like the awfulness of these sort of things, like what can we still learn in terms of like, all right, in terms of approach or how to deal with other people's, what's the nice word I'm looking for, uh, difficulty, but like how can we use even like negative examples as still like yes. a way to learn? So I'll throw that out there as like just something that I was. Yeah, thinking. no, that's really interesting to take every opportunity. And I, I think what you're saying, Tyler, is when you come across unexpected situations, how can you then make the most of those? Yeah. Yeah, I think um, that's really fascinating, yeah. Simmons has an example here. I'll, I'll read this. Uh, education is exploration has worked for me as a teacher. Maybe a first step to this, so. Yes, yeah. yes, brilliant. Is yes. Any any other thoughts on these four provocations from the audience, from the online audience? When I read about the language and culture of instruction, that this teaching must be offered in more than the language and culture of instruction. I'm just connecting to the culturally responsive classroom spaces. Sorry, connected to what video? Culturally responsive classroom spaces. Yes, culturally responsive classrooms, absolutely, yes. And um, there's, a, there's a really famous, uh, the most wonderful quote by Nelson Mandela, who says, if you talk to a person uh, in the language of instruction, that goes to their head. If you talk to a person in their own language, that goes to their heart. And uh, as you will see through other presentation, the whole of the job not knowing approach is based upon um, making sure that the emotional aspect of this the learner uh, is totally engaged in the in the process of learning. Um, so, yes, that's really uh, really really exciting, fabulous, brilliant. So, um, if students have an expectation of what teaching is, what was that one? Uh, if students have an expectation of what teaching is, they might not think they are learning. True. They may think that uh, they they might not think they are learning. They might not think that they yes, yes, yes. It's yes, we need to teach children how to think. Yes, absolutely. Um, absolutely. And the whole of the the whole of the uh, of the philosophy is, thank you, was that so? Um, it was, yes. Is based upon creating the conditions in which the curriculum, the learning is always presented in a way that promotes creative thinking, critical thinking, very much philosophical thinking. Um, and yes, so the ability to think independently and think in all those ways is right at the heart. Um, the moment that, what was that one again? Uh, the moment one starts teaching, learning stops. <laughs> yeah. Yes, that's brilliant. I love that comment. That is superb. That's brilliant. Okay, so let's, what we'll do is let's unpick one at a time. Um, but before we do that, I just wanted to show you that if you look at these, um, 
in, in more detail, the, the top one and two tend to be more the traditional metacognitive approaches, uh, where the learner is constantly and at all times aware of the uh, learning that's taking place and how they are doing within that learning. So it's a, it's a very metacognitive um, process. Three and four um, are examples of what I call the dysmetacognition um, situation of learning, where the students are actually learning without consciously realizing that, that, um, that they're learning. So we'll go through each one of those, but just to give you an example, uh, how those four are differentiated. And what I wanted to share with you right from the beginning is the impact that this philosophy, this culture, this way of approaching the learning process and the teaching process has on an individual uh, child. This is Monica, who's a 10-year-old child um, at the end of uh, this is teaching uh, in Bristol. And at the end of the year, she wrote this for her end of year report. Um, and I just think that the words that Monica wrote here represent and reflect absolutely everything that we have uh, collected here in terms of the A to Z of what education is actually for, the purpose of schooling, the purpose of what we're trying to create uh, with, with children in order to make them not just um, individuals who acquire knowledge in the moment, but we are transforming these amazing young brains and people into, we're, we're forming them into effective lifelong learners who are then able to contribute cultural capital and able to manage anything that life then throws at them. As you know, one of the chapters is about lifelong learning disposition. So through the curriculum and through this approach, the children become very, very aware of the things that they need to succeed, not just at school, but in life. So um, things like being curious and creative as a thinker and strategically aware um, and being able to work uh, collaboratively. Those are the skills that are, that are a golden thread throughout the whole of the approach. But look what Monica says, year five was special for me and I know for others too. Before I came to year five, I thought that when you learn, it's just about intelligence. So my whole life, my whole time in education, I've been trying to move away from that concept that people have in terms of how they regard being at school, being learning, in terms of how that it's all based on how intelligent you are. Um, and uh, because I believe that every child, every learner is equally intelligent, and it's just, it's just, it's just how we create the conditions in which everyone can express themselves. Um, and then she says, "But now I know it's about love for learning, creativity, happiness, and effort. I can't think of four better words that describes the process by which, for which education." Um, uh, that underpins the the, uh, the process of education. A love for learning. This is a ten-year-old child. Creativity, that whole aspect of creative thinking, having new ideas, happiness. You know the emotional side of things that we were you know we were saying earlier how important that is, and most importantly of all is effort. You know this is what we were saying right at the beginning. This if the children realise that it takes effort. It's, if it's easy, we're not making any progress. All progress in society has come from overcoming major obstacles in the world. Every, every big advancement in society has come from overcoming big barriers. And, and the fact that Monica says that it's all about effort means that she's embracing that uncertainty, embracing the difficulty, embracing been in a position of, of having to uh, challenge uh, themselves. So I just thought that's such a wonderful thing to be able to, to have right from the beginning of our discussion that places everything um, in perspective in terms of the outcome that it has on children's emotions. So I just want to start with the first one um, and, how, uh, and to try and convince you how brilliant it is to not know 
um, and how brilliant it is for the concept to be very explicitly shared with the students and with the children uh, so that the children themselves actually recognize the value of not knowing uh, ahead of the value of always wanting to know. Um, so uh, embracing the two. Um, but what I'd like to say here is that it's, um, it, it's in saying that it's brilliant to not know, it's, it mustn't be confused with ignorance. So it's exactly the opposite to ignorance because the message that is sent here with uh, how brilliant it is to not know is so that the children realize or the students realize that it's brilliant to not know because that is the, the position that we must be in in order to learn. And, and, and then what happens is that the, the culture and the conditions that we create makes them want to learn it as opposed to not want to learn it, which is the going down the ignorance path. So this is creating the enthusiasm for wanting to know what the children know that they don't know. Yeah, so that's this, the enthusiasm for wanting to know that this, uh, that this creates. But in order to do this, um, uh, I designed a, um, a kind of model which is shared with, with the students based on uh, the learning pit, which I uh, first came across um, through the wonderful work of James Nottingham. Um, and <clears throat> what I will need, what I'll do is, um, I'll need two volunteers here, please, uh, so that I can model it for you and share with you the exact way in which this can be shared in your own context. I think um, you're all, um, you, you're in uh, law, criminal law, you Criminology. say? Criminology. Criminology. And what's your? Entrepreneurship. In? Entrepreneurship. Entrep entrepreneurship, yeah. I, I just want to show that it's, 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 it goes beyond, any, it goes beyond education and it's just something that, um, that it, it's just part of everyday life for us all. Um, but I do need a couple of volunteers. <laughs> Demone. <laughs> what do I need to, what do uh, yeah, you need to come up here. So you, um, I'm, I'm going to place you here. I'm not in... representing my department. No, 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 no. So you're here in position one. Um, and then we've got a, a brilliantly set out room already because it is in the shape of the of the learning pit. Um, but we need another person. Thank you. So it's Simone and Cornell. 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 Is that right? It's K at the start, okay. but that's fine. Cool enough. Brilliant. You both start, to the, uh, start in position one, if that's okay, start okay. together. So what's happening here, and I hope you can see uh, on, online, we have uh, Simone and Cornell both standing where you can see the question mark and position one. Now that is the position where we're all at, at any time that we have to do anything at all in life. That's the beginning of anything. For me to find the building today, I was there. You know, anything that we do in life at all, we always start there. It's not just a learning objective in a lesson. This is where we all start. Um, so now you'll see how this uh, this this uh, place. Um, so um, Simone, how are you? Okay. How are you feeling? On the spot. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> this is brilliant. Do you, you feel a little bit anxious, a little bit nervous on the spot? Yes. Yes. Little, yes. Brilliant. How are you feeling, Colonel? Similar. Similar. Yeah. Anxious. Brilliant. I'm so pleased that you're feeling worried, that you're feeling anxious, that you're feeling uncertain, that you don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. Now this is brilliant because this is exactly how a learner feels when they're about to learn. And the whole idea of the joy of not knowing is to, and you'll see because we will do this, is to now remove how you're naturally feeling. This is a human, human natural feeling when you're about to do something you haven't done before yeah. or when you're in personal position. Yeah, so this is brilliant. So what I'm really fascinated by is that if we have 30 children in a, in a class who are feeling like this when they're about to learn, then that's not the best start to the learning process. 
this is why I've developed this philosophy, this philosophy because it, 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 it then transforms how you're feeling there to an enthusiasm for being there. Okay, so let's try and do this. So, um, Simone, where, where were you born? In Italy. In Italy, whereabouts? Piemont, near yeah. Turin. Near Turin, That's fantastic, Turin. Yeah. brilliant. So what you can do now, uh, Simone, is jump across to the other side to the three. So if you're careful with the wires, but just jump across, jump. Over here? Yeah, brilliant. Right. So Simone has jumped across the pit because she knew the answer, brilliant. Cornell, how are you feeling now? Still the same. <laughs> <laughs> you're okay. feeling a little bit more worried now that you know Simone's had a, an easy Question, are you predicting that yours might not? I was not expecting questioning at all. <laughs> but yes, yes, I, I, I've seen that example. And, You've uh, seen an example, yes. so you might cope with that example well? Yes. But are you thinking that maybe yours might not be so easy? We'll see. <laughs> we'll see, brilliant. So that's the adventure for now, okay. Brilliant. So, Connor, where was I born? I have no clue. Do you know or don't you know? I, I don't know. Brilliant. So you don't know. So when children say that, we say to them, or a student, it's brilliant that you don't know. And many of them say this is the first time, even, you know, older or students at university, it's the first time anybody has ever said to me that it's brilliant to not know. And celebrate that. Yeah? It's brilliant to know. Because why is it so good that you don't know? What can you do now? I can learn. Brilliant. So what you can do is go and join Tyler. At, so now you're in two. So you walk into the pit. And in the pit is where everything happens. So now you're in two, position two. This is where you use all your skills or your previous knowledge, all your strategies, all your ability to problem solve. Everything that you have, the culture that you're learning in, everything that you have, to be able to solve the problem. So what strategies could you use to solve this problem now? Tyler. Exactly. So <laughs> brilliant. Or the gentleman who was born. Brilliant. So, <laughs> so that's brilliant. So rather than asking the teacher straight away, you're thinking, right, there may be some brilliant use and strategies. Maybe someone that knows me before may know the answer. That's brilliant. Good. Yeah. Tyler, do you know? I don't remember. I did know. I did know. You That's did a different know. distinction. I used to Hang know. On, I'm thinking. I'm thinking. Any any hint about geographical region, country? Narrow it no, down for me. I lost it. Somewhere in the UK. Somewhere in the UK. <laughs> <laughs> I was definitely not born in the UK. But um, should have okay. gone to Italy. Uh, no. So let us start narrowing it down. Narrow it down. Brilliant. So you can what use continent? some. Um, so, uh, South America. South America. Okay. okay. Uh, Brazil. Uh, further south. Further south. Argentine. Uh huh. Okay. Brilliant. Okay. Brilliant. So, through questioning, you have worked out the answer. Is it Brilliant. easy to pick a uh, uh, city? Or is it oh, yes, you can more? pick a city, yeah. Yeah. Uh, obviously, let me start with Buenos Aires. Yes, in Buenos Aires. Okay. Perfect. Correct. Yeah. Brilliant, Cornell. Brilliant. So you can now, you've now worked out the answer. So you can join, you can walk out of the pit and join Simone back in three. Um, but what's really interesting about this is that now uh, you can see that both Simone and Cornell started in the same place and ended in the same place. But Simone, when you went from here to there, which is the same place as Cornell, did you learn anything new? No. No, brilliant. But you were happy that you knew the answer. So, brilliant. So, in being happy that you didn't, that you knew the answer, you haven't learned anything new. Cornell, when you were really worried and you didn't know the answer and you went through this process, have you now come to the same spot, Simone, but with new knowledge? Yes. You have. And with that new knowledge comes more curiosity. So, you're probably wondering when I came over, what it's like to live in Buenos Aires, do I say Spanish? where Simone doesn't have any of those follow-up questions. So the, 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 the joy of not knowing is that you now have new knowledge, but then new knowledge is, is sparking further curiosity and further knowledge. So it's the, the whole concept of joy comes into the, the self-fulfillment. It's all, all in this very, very simple process. 
So this enables the children to very, very quickly realize that in order to learn something new, they have to not know it first. And if you already know the answer, you're not learning anything new. So that transforms the culture of learning. It's not that the teacher is trying to trick them or put them in a difficult position on purpose. It's, it's where we have to be in order to learn. But then how we create those conditions in which children and learners feel safe and able to thrive in these conditions where we're purposely putting them in a situation of uncertainty is the key. So is, um, as, uh, the whole approach is based on being a values-led approach, a, a democratic approach, a community of inquiry approach, where everyone feels free to talk and discuss. You know, it's based on all that underpinning um, uh, sets of, of um, uh, values that, that come into play um, in, 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 in terms of the, the, the environment that is created in order for, for this uh, to happen. I was once doing this and a child in year four, Simone, did, did the jump across and said, um, a, 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 a year four child said, Mistress, I think you're completely wrong. When I jumped across, I did learn something. And I thought my whole philosophy of education was going to crumble on the spot. Um, and he said, well, it was very easy. When I jumped across, I learned that I already knew it. And I thought that was amazing because that's metacognition from a, an eight-year-old child being you know, placed in these scenarios at its best. He was thinking that he, what, of what he knew that he already knew, which is the whole metacognitive process. That's brilliant. Can we give our two volunteers a very, very big clap, please? Thank you so much. And then what happens is that um, when this is actually put into practice, it becomes a uh, much more of a six-step process. So what we can see here is that in step one, uh, we are thinking uh, very metacognitively about what we know that we know and what we know that we don't know. So imagine children or students from a very early age, when you set the learning going, all them thinking, oh, I, I know that I already know something about this, but I also know that I don't know certain things about this, what we're about to learn. So that's that whole curiosity. And this not knowing what we don't know comes enveloped with a whole of part of the approach because a, in, in the teaching cycle, um, the, the approach um, encourages the teacher to preview the learning. This is a real key aspect. So when the learner comes to the position of learning, to that situation, they have come pre prepared, having pre thought and pre discussed and pre researched and pre questioned what they're about to learn. So they know what they don't know, but they then they already, before anything starts, they're curious about what they're about to learn as well, that they know they don't know. And then moving to two is intrinsic motivation. So in two, the child uh, or the student wants to know what they know they don't know. They want to launch into the, into the learning because they feel they're able to thrive within the environment that's created. And they do that because of three, um, where Cornell was, because in three, they know that everything is in place for them to be able to know how to know what they want to know that they know they don't know. So that connection makes the learning process incredibly exciting. Um, and if, if they feel equipped in three with everything they need to be able to know how to know, then they'll be wanting to know what they know they don't know, rather than be worried at the beginning that they don't know I'm not launching into the process at all. Um, and then three and four is a really lovely spiral where they're constantly metacognitively thinking about what they, what, how, how the learning is going. Um, and eventually, when they think about the, the, how the learning is going, they will be able to climb out onto five. But five is very exciting because five is knowledge and six is wisdom. So they know that once they've come to five, it's not enough just to have the knowledge but then curiosity and um, enrichment tasks and putting, 
making them use the knowledge in different situations, all that leads to them being able to uh, have that wisdom. So six is a really important part of um, making sure that the, the student doesn't feel that acquiring the knowledge is just the end product or is enough. Um, so this is um, uh, a very exciting prospect. And in, you know, there are lots of classrooms, including many schools around here. This is why it's so special today, but many schools in around the Cambridge, Ipswich, uh, Suffolk area are uh, engaged with this. They have this in their classroom. So the children realize that the inspirational teaching, they're learning, they're learning to learn culture. And as we'll see at the end, they're learning to learn week, which launches the academic year and equips them with all these skills and strategies, helps them to feel comfortable when they are uncomfortable in the, in the pits. Um, and this is just to show you how uh, this is when I was head, uh, head teacher of Hartford Infants and Nursery School, have from very, very early on, the children go through what you've just gone through. Um, this is our first day of the academic year, and look how they are just living it. And, for, and yeah, I just think that there's nothing more valuable, and you know, those children have it for, for life. This is part of their, how their DNA um, as, as they grow up, and this way of thinking. Um, and this is really interesting. Um, uh, I'm sure Tyler will share the slides with you. Um, so I wanted to give you these slides so that you're able to use them with in your context. But the interesting thing here is that if you look down the left hand side, I've listed all the things that make us feel comfortable emotionally when we're about to learn something or when we are doing anything at all. If we think that we are not confused, if we are certain that we know how to do things, if we know that we have the knowledge, if it's possible, if we are in the surroundings of an expert, we feel safe, don't we? We feel safe and able, able to be there. Um, but my provocation to you today, my argument is that if you are in that left-hand side, you're not learning anything new. So in order to learn something new, we have to be on the right-hand side. We have to know that we don't know. We have to feel confused, as you were a little bit uh, here. We, find we have to, you know, we can't help but to feel a little bit uncomfortable um, and uncertain, and sometimes to think that it's impossible um, and that we may not have the understanding or the learning expertise. But if you, these are called concept lines, which is part of the junk approach, where children map themselves during the year of how far they are along those lines. It's incredibly exciting for the children to, to do this. And it's something for you to, uh, to, to look at. If we now move on to the second provocation, which is really exciting and builds on this one. Um, this is a quote from Albert Einstein when he said that he never teaches his students. He just provides the conditions in which they can learn. Um, I think that's a really deep and special uh, expression, but... I don't think it's enough. I don't think it's enough to provide the conditions in which somebody can learn. Why do you think that might be? Because you need some level of provocation of a mind to trigger it. Amazing, Cornell. Brilliant. You need you need what I call this is, this is a a Marcello addition to the Einstein quote. You need I feel that you also need, it's not just enough to provide the conditions in which they can learn, but you need to provide the conditions in which the learner will feel intrinsically motivated to want to learn, as we saw. So this is a jump from one to two. And they will feel intrinsically motivated to want to learn because or if they feel equipped with everything they need to succeed. And what I've always been really fascinated by is not just equipping them with um, sort of cognition, but also equipping them with uh, a sense of, an, of well-being. And that well-being for me is from an emotional, a social, cognitive, academic, cultural, linguistic well-being. So the wholeness of well-being comes into play. Um, and also very much where every student feels that they're an expert in learning. And we share, wanted to share this analogy with you because it may be really useful in terms of your, um, uh, your own context where 
education for me is like um, education and architecture for me have many, many analogies uh, and, and, and synergies. But if you, if you think about how an architect works, an architect has incredibly detailed plans before they start anything off. So before a building is built, you have to have incredibly detailed plans. They know everything to the nth degree of measurements, materials, everything. They have their plans before they start. In, in education, it's the same. We all have long-term plans, very detailed lesson plans. You know, we all have our plans of what we're going to achieve. It's the same, isn't it? Architects then go and source expert plumbers, expert electricians, expert engineers, expert bricklayers. They source a series of experts to enable that to come true. Yeah, to enable the building to be built, you have to source a series of experts. Now, when you share this with the children, the teacher says, well, in education, it's the same. I have my plans and who are my experts? Is you, all of you. And when you say that to the children, that every single one of them is the expert plumber, expert electrician, they're all contributing their own expertise like a jigsaw to make the whole plan of the teacher come true. And that's the sense that they get from day one of being an expert of learning, helping the, the whole culture move of the classroom move together. So it's a really lovely um, analogy. And this is supported by then every single child uh, developing their own model of learning. So um, every child is asked to describe a model um, which is called a model of learning. So describe how they view learning themselves as a model. And these are created in that first learning to learn week. And they're so, so special because um, once a child has um, kind of described and uh, articulated how learning feels for them, then the teacher is able to refer to that language and to that model throughout the year. These are placed um, on, a, uh, on, on display in the classroom. So, you know, they all feel equally intelligent, as we were saying earlier. They feel that it's been um, uh, uh, appreciated and, and uh, it's on the wall. And then the teacher uses their language to personalize the learning and the feedback conversations with that child uh, throughout the year. So, for example, this child says, uh, said that uh, learning to them feels is, is like going into a maze. You go in, you don't know where the, the exit is, you get stuck, you have to go back, you, but eventually you find your way out. Um, and teachers use that to say, you know, whereabouts in the maze are you when you're learning any, anything that, that, that they may be doing? So um, these are really, really fantastic to support their expertise. This is a, a six-year-old child who is passionate about uh, dinosaurs. And can you see he has interpreted the model of the pit and saying when he's at one, uh, he's at in prehistoric times, um, and then goes through the pit, and when he comes out on at three, he's in human time. Um, so it's in, amazing how, if you feel how this child would feel in the classroom, you know, he what he's passionate about in terms of, of himself as a person has been translated into a, the, the model of learning. So he's not, he, he's, he's now learning, he's in the classroom, he's learning, he's tapping into it his whole way of being, his all his interests, his na na natural interests is not, the person is not, at school is not dissociated from uh, the, the individual outside of school and how they are. This is, these are so fantastic. I love this one, this is a year six child who um, said my learning model is like turning a computer on. I'm sure we all know what it's like waiting for the uh, computer to load and it's crossed out OAD and put E-A-R-N, -E so loading to learning. Um, when, and it's just incredible how these, these simple ideas make children think so uh, creatively and so openly. I was going to, um, uh, we're a little bit short of time, I was going to get you to all create your own, um, but if, you are, whilst I carry on, if maybe you think of one, then tell us if you're online or here. If you, I don't know if anything comes to mind of analogy, a model of learning that any of you may think of. 
you know, some people say it's like climbing a ladder one step at a time or um, like a marathon that you start and you have to keep going and you have uh, you know, stops of water along the way um, or a Formula One race where you all start at the same time all go, go at different speeds you have to stop at the pit, change tyres come up Again, you know, come up onto and then finally finish. So change size, you adapt into the situation. Yes, corner. Pathfinder, a path. A pathfinder, brilliant. Tell us a little bit more. Like you know, you are writing a map for yourself. Of brilliant. The territory. I love it, Cornell. Brilliant. So you you seen as a map. Brilliant. But uh, maps you're learning are absolutely brilliant. And along the way, would you have bumps and obviously yes, <laughs> and barriers and brilliant, amazing. Learning is putting a puzzle together. Yes, I love that. The this, this thoughts of the jigs being a, seen as a jigsaw is absolutely fantastic. Brilliant. Thank you so, so much. That is really, really, really good. Priscilla um, has a question too. Yes. Uh, still haven't figured out my own model, which should be <laughs> oh, uh, as a compass also. Oh, good. Yeah. A compass. Yeah. Oh, that's. Priscilla can't figure out a model. Like for anyone that's still thinking about what their learning model should be, what, what could they do? Oh, um, chat with me afterwards. Okay, all right. <laughs> we'll stick around afterwards. Yeah, no, that's brilliant. Every, everyone would have a, I think the, I think it's just having lots of different ideas. It could be anything at all. It's just how you visualize and how you think about yourself when you're in the learning situation. That's brilliant. Fabulous. Now, the second half of the talk, which is really, really exciting. So all that's kind of very much as you saw, very metacognitive. You're thinking about what you know, what you don't know, uh, and you're acting on it because the conditions enable you to, uh, uh, to, to be comfortable emotionally to act on it. What I'm really fascinated by is number three, the, what I've now called in the dismetacognition, where the best learning happens, what I feel when students don't realize that they're learning. And I suppose that, um, uh, that that was what's needed uh, to be added to this quote as well. Uh, so provide the conditions in which they can learn because they're intrinsically motivated, uh, but also when, when is all that is best? I think all that is, is at its best when we don't realise that we're actually learning. And I'd be really interested to hear your thoughts on this because it's, it's very new thinking. Um, presenting to you uh, now. But I think that the root of this um, came from when I was a head teacher of the infant uh, and nursery school, where obviously the uh, early years, the EYFS curriculum was uh, the dominant uh, culture in, in, the, in the classroom. And I, I loved observing children learning uh, in, in the EYFS. And what really strikes you is the enthusiasm. So children are innately enthusiastic to want to learn. So that's the first thing, that we need to develop an educational system that, that keeps promoting that rather than, rather than takes that away, that innateness to want to learn. These children don't haven't been told you have to do this. This is a, from an article I wrote um, uh, and the, this, this photograph is just incredible. We just placed uh, equipment out in the playground and within a few minutes, the reception children had all gathered together, worked as a team and created the, this most incredible car wash or bike wash, as they called it. And you can see that, you know, everyone, this was in a school that's in the 10, was in the 10 percent most deprived areas uh, in England. Uh, so it's, it's I th what I love about this approach is that it, it's just so universal and treats, you know, every individual is, is so, so special regardless of context. Um, and you can see that every child has got a, a role, a, a job. The, what amazes me most about this is they're waiting so patiently in line. Can you see the queue? They're wait these are four-year-olds um, waiting patient in line, testing, and the 
And if you look at every child is smiling, you know, I just think in this, there's, there must be something that we can learn about how very little children learn. And to me, it's because they are not realizing or haven't been told that they have to learn specific things. They are discovering things for themselves. And um, throughout my time in education, I've always been really fascinated in creating these conditions further up the school and now obviously at university where we present the learning in a way that the students um, are not fully consciously aware that they're learning. And it's, it's a term um, that I use called intellectual playfulness. So you're presenting the learning in a playful way, but with a, with a strong intellectual um, uh, uh, backbone to it and thought. And that's a phrase that um, uh, I was introduced to by uh, Deborah Eyre. We did a lot of work together um, in, in, the, in the realm of gifted and talented children. Um, uh, many years ago, but um, I just think it describes it beautifully. And what, what, if we then link it to this model that we've been using, what happens is that you're not jumping across like Simone uh, did, and you're not going into the pit like Cornell did, but what you're doing is you're using your automatic forward momentum. So you're not even thinking that you're moving from one to three because you're just doing it naturally. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a very, very exciting uh, way of thinking about uh, learning. And the way that I'd like to um, get you to experience this is by doing this following exercise. Have you all got a little bit of paper online? You need to have your little bit of paper and then we'll go through these one at a time. <laughs> Um, and yourselves here as well. I've got it on the, on the chart. So the first, um, imagine that we are trying to learn um, about the number six or about addition or how to count. And, you know, all those, so that's the kind of our learning objective. I'm going to present the learning in three different ways. And I'd like you to then tell me from your own experience which one feels the most wonderful way of being presented with the learning, the one that you enjoy the most, the one that leads to the most satisfaction, the one that makes you think more creatively, more deeply, the one that makes you excited about the process of learning. Okay, so number one is, can you all do the top one, one, add two, add three. Can you all do it? Have you got? It's off, so. <laughs> get yourself some paper, some pad here. You need to do this. Pen is here. It's the excuse. Yeah, yeah. It's the experience of actually doing it that will really illustrate. Um, really illustrate the process of deep metacognition. So have we all done one, add two, or three? Thank you. Yeah? Have we got an answer, Simon? <laughs> <laughs> We've got an answer, Tyler? Six. Thanks. Thank you. Brilliant. Now, the second one is you can use the numbers one, two, and three in any way that you like, and you need to come up with as, as many different ways of making six as possible. You can use anything at all. Um, you can use squares, square roots, brackets, any, any, any mathematical operation at all, but they have to have the numbers one, two, and three, and the answer has to be six.
Did you mean adding up to six or including multiplication and division? You can do any any mathematical operation, oh. sorry, anything at all. This is where the intellectual playfulness comes into play. Mm. Okay, um, and hopefully you've got uh, a few. And then the third one, it's a really exciting one. You have to draw yourselves um, a three by three square. I don't know if you can see this online, but it's a three by three square. It's like knots and crosses game, isn't it? Yeah, like knots and crosses, exactly. Three by three square. And your challenge is you have to use three ones, three twos, and three threes to populate the squares. Oh, brilliant. Zoom here. Are they coming in? Oops. In case anyone wants a sneak preview, maybe that's a little bit better. Brilliant. Yeah, so three by three square. And you have to use three ones, three twos, and three threes in these nine squares so that every row, every column, and every diagonal adds up to six. And then Andy has a question. Andy. Can you use a number more than one? No, uh, not, in the, not in the second one, but you can, obviously, in the third one, you have to use three ones, three twos, and three threes. The first one, one more look. Yeah, good. Thank you. You got it? Well, I'll be shocked because my glass <laughs> is not my fault. But I don't know if I got it. It looks like mine. Huh? But people still. Has anyone got it online? Let's just go and tie that. I need more time. <laughs> <laughs> Have you got it, Cornell? Andy, have you got it? Oh, it's just telling. It's three, one, two. Oh, yeah, just fill in. Oh, okay. Can I see that square again? Yeah. Um, did I do it correctly? I'm, I'm a bit shocked because ah. I'm really bad at maths. Six, 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 six. Genius. Wow. Six, six, six. Let me put it on. Well, I'm a bit shocked. That, but see, that is amazing. <laughs> I know. Okay, so Simone, you've done two, one, three. Three, two, one, and one, three, two. That's brilliant. So, um, 
there are there are various various combinations. That's that's one. Obviously, you you know you can turn it all around and so on. But the the important thing here is having gone through this process is that I like to suggest that most of our educational system just does the first one. You know, there's rows and rows of sums been done. Uh, text has been used with sums. Gets to the right answer. Ticks. You know, this is kind of the traditional knowledge experience, isn't it? Yeah, is that right online? Just it's just knowledge, isn't it? You're just working out, finding out. It's just knowledge. Um, with two, has anybody got any combinations that they've used? Just put them on the chat or call them out. Any combinations of one, two, three that gave you six? Or here? For the second one? <laughs> For the second one, yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. Do we have to use all the numbers? I forgot what you said. Uh, you have to use one, two, three each time. Okay. So have you got a different combination apart from one, add two, or three? <laughs> um, I did. Hang on a second. It could just be three, add two, add one. You know, it could. Well, I kind of cheated, and I had one squared plus two squared plus three. That's fine. Right, one squared plus two. One plus squared two. plus. Plus two plus three. That's two plus three. Brilliant. That's another way of doing it. Excellent. Any other ways? Any other combinations? Three squared divided by, wait, now I'm confused. I don't know how to read these. Uh, Katrina's got three plus three times three divided by three. Three plus three. <coughs> Excuse me. Times three. Times three. Divided by three. Divided by three. Brilliant. That's six. Brilliant. Um, but you also, you also have, you know, all the com all the different combinations of the order of the numbers. Yeah, so three at two at one, one at two at three, three at one at two. You've got all these different combinations. So when the children start to do the different combinations, three at two at one, they start to think systematically. Yeah, so how many combinations can there be of one at two at three? It's a systematic approach. So you're not just developing knowledge, but you're also developing some sort of understanding of the rule of mathematics, of the rule of adding, of enabling the children to, to start to think strategically. So it's, it's getting to the same answer, but they're using quite a lot of uh, understanding. And then three is the wisdom and the intellectual playfulness and the dismetacognition. Did you feel by doing three, that you were using the fact that you knew that one or two or three, <laughs> but you weren't actually thinking that that's what you were doing. Yeah. That was easy. Yeah. For me, that was so easy. <laughs> I did it so quickly. The other one, I had to think. Yeah. Hard. Yeah. So this one you enjoy because you were just playing. You didn't re the others you were thinking about you were doing. So this is this is kind of a, a, a little example of how. Um, the kind of this metacognition can be used uh, to to really bring out that playfulness. You're still getting the children to work with one, two, and three, making six, but they're doing it in a in a in a very playful, intellectually playful approach, and discovery, and trial and error, and all sorts of other things. It's an enjoyment of doing it. I've got here the most exciting thing. Um, where there's a there's a really interesting challenge called the four fours challenge. Um, I don't know if you can see, uh, yeah here uh, the, the four fours challenge where you use four fours each time to make every number, um, and then it's just like one of those starters. And then um, this year five children went home, and the next day they brought that in. They've done every number to 150. Um, using square, square roots, powers of zeros, because it was just incredible. The amount of math that they did doing that, no one asked them to. This was, this was this metacognitive 
wanting, intrinsic motivation, wanting to do something that was triggered by the enthusiasm with which the task was presented in the classroom. So this is what I mean by the intrinsic motivation to go way beyond what we expect. And these children then um, became so close in terms of working together as a group. They became really well known in the school for math, you know, being mathematical, led to lots of others wanting to beat 150. You know, it was amazing. But this, it was amazing because it's just the way it was presented to them enabled them to want to do it. That's kind of that magical aspect. If I just done A, um, none of that would have happened. So as you can see here, the K, the U, the W is what I find really interesting with this metacognition, that it goes from knowledge to understanding to wisdom, um, which is um, really, really exciting. Um, and just another example of how this can uh, take place in the classroom is through the presentation itself of the learning objective. And I've developed a, a really lovely way of um, engaging and enthusing the children to, um, to take part or to want to engage, so go from one to two, by developing a method of um, sharing the learning objective with them through a philosophical question. So I believe that every lesson or everything that we need to uh, learn, anything in the curriculum, can be expressed philosophically as a question, as a way in to the enthusiasm with the learning. So for example, if we're learning about 2D shapes, the traditional way, which is just based on knowledge, is to be able to learn about the properties of 2D shapes. That's very traditional. The second one is, can we investigate the properties of 2D shapes? So now we're thinking a lot more about understanding. Can we? We're all together. Makes the learning environment much more comfortable um, in a situation of uncomfort. But the one I love so much is the W, the wisdom. If we just say to the students, do 2D shapes exist as they weigh in to looking at 2D shapes, is so incredibly fascinating because I don't think 2D shapes exist. Do you? It's really interesting, isn't it? Because teachers, children, they, they've never thought about it like this. They go to their drawer in their classrooms, they call it a, a whole drawer full of 2D shapes, and they bring them up to the front. They say, yes, they do. Look, here's one. And they bring you, obviously, what's a 3D shape. Yeah, if you, they said, but it's flat, you know, so it's just all this dialogue, talk rich learning classrooms is, is so fascinating with this approach. So anything and everything, I think, if it's introduced through a philosophical uh, tone, then it can really induce so much um, interest, thinking, enthusiasm. Uh, and fun. It's, it's full of humour. These philosophical questions are full of, um, of, of full of fun. But also enables the teacher to really understand the level of understanding within the classroom. Because in trying to answer these really funny questions, the children start to use all the knowledge that they have to be able to make sense of it. And that's where you really see where this class is, and where every child is, and where the misconceptions are, and how to build on. So. It's a really practical way of, um, of, of doing this with the, with the students. Um, the the other, other examples are the thinking school starters that we did at the beginning, the A to Z. You know, it's a whole thing you, you can read when you get a presentation of how much, uh, how, how, it, how, how amazing impact they have uh, on children's view of the learning process and how they feel about coming into school from an emotional point of view. Um, there's things like um, this, a lot of this work happened when I was uh, teaching in Bristol, and we did things like um, how much, you know, that's the suspension bridge you have to pay to go across, so how much money does a suspension bridge company make in a year? You know, so if I wanted to teach about um, all the operations in mathematics, then just setting them with a question like that was incredible, because they have to think about how many cars go through per hour, per day, are all the days different? You know, just they got so much 
and it's and it's applicable to to real life. Um, things like playing scrabbles well, with the family, so getting the children to uh, play with a friend or with a member of the family, if they do it at home. Anything, all the things that they know about a subject as a scrabble uh, uh, played ar around the scrabble board. Um, so they think about uh, a word, they fit it within the scrabble board, and then they score it using the scrabble letter. So this is also a brilliant way to assess before and after uh, the teaching. So before the scrabble board would be um, not very full of words, at the end of the teaching process, you will see the scroll board has so many more words, and that's the impact of the teaching. And again, all these are examples of learning without realizing that they're learning. And this is what happens towards the end. They become very effective lifelong learners. Um, they create a recipe for an effective lifelong learner. Some of the children go home and cook that recipe, as Charlie did, uh, his own lemon cake, and look at his smile of, you know, just this is learning going home. You know, this is it, the impact that it has on the emotion of children is just incredible. And again, I've given you the uh, lifelong learning dispositions with the opposites on the other side so that you can use them to match um, and map yourselves and your students in your context where you feel you are uh, along those uh, those lines. Um, and just in terms of how all this fits into the big picture of curriculum and education and, uh, and the whole process that we go through, um, the theory, policy and practice are key to everything that we do in education. And the practice is built up of uh, the teacher's own knowledge and the children's own knowledge and the pedagogy that's been used. And what I wanted to show here is that within the pedagogy, what I'm arguing for is that teachers are equipped with metacognitive and dismetacognitive um, skills to present the learning at different times in different ways so that we can um, uh, build knowledge which which develops understanding and uh, leads uh, on to wisdom and as you can see here the EYFS leads the way on the dismetacognition but the national curriculum and uh, higher and all phases of education are able to uh, fit into that pattern through the intellectual, into that cycle through the intellectual playful approach. And just to end with, this is my favourite, favourite thing of all. It's just that the impact that this has had on, uh, on students and how they feel is so transformational. The idea is that we see every individual with so much richness uh, in terms of how they are, the, all the language, their culture, everything that they bring with them, and to tap into that as part of the daily teaching and learning process is really, really exciting. Um, so this is called Multilingual Thinking and Learning in Multicultural Classrooms. Um, and I've, to make it um, kind of um, accessible from a pedagogical point of view, I divided it into sort of three sections. One where you can uh, say to the children or the student that they can engage with the learning in the language that they prefer. So if you're writing a poem, say you write it all in your preferred language and then in the language of instruction. So you're using language independently. But two and three then go on to uh, using language uh, in combination with each other. So you're using more than one language at a time to engage with the learning. In, the, in two, the, the, uh, the teacher sets out a structure. So for example, with a poem, you might write one verse in one language, one verse in another language, and so on, and alternate. And in three is what I prefer. I'm... For me, the most ideal thing when I'm speaking is to, to do Span English, is to do a, a whole combination at the same time, of which, whichever word comes to me best. If, if I'm speaking to someone that speaks English and Spanish, then that's my ideal. I, can, I just mix it all up. Um, um, and that is, um, uh, I don't know if you know of the work of uh, Albert Costa, but he's the there's a lot of research that this multilinguality leads to very um, powerful cognitive 
um, development in the brain of not just of the bilingual or multilingual learner, but of all the learners in the classroom. So there's a lot of research uh, 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 that, that supports the idea of, of using a multilingual approach. And then it just examples in number one, um, I've got it here actually, a little um, book that the children in reception wrote on poetry. I wanted to write a foreword when I was head teacher of the school. And for me, um, Un Canto para Hartford, you know, a song for Hartford, is, it, came, it, it was so much more natural for me to write it in Spanish first. And if you read it in Spanish, it's really meaningful, really deep. When I translated it in English, I lost, you lose all that feeling and thought. So I'm thinking if a child is, is engaging in the classroom and can only engage in language of instruction, they would feel totally inhibited in terms of what they're producing because they've not been allowed to tap into the how they feel they're most naturally able to to express themselves and the uh the one on the right is really fascinating i developed the idea of having a a thinking blackboard in the playground at the school where i would put one of these challenges or starters questions in the morning and chalk and then all the families would engage uh with that before school started uh, so this is a kind of coming together of the family, contributing to what, what was on the board and contributing to it multilingually and also multiculturally. We, um, it's a really amazing story. We, I was there when the Chilean miners got stuck on, um, you know, they, they, they got stuck and they were being rescued. The day they were rescued, um, I put out their message for the Chilean miners and every family wrote in their own language a message to the miners and we sent it to them. You know, it's just such a powerful way of, of creating that multicultural um, culture in, in, a, in, a, in a learning environment. If you think all the time of moving away from just language of instruction, how much more rich this becomes, it's really, really exciting. Um, in two, the structure, so you can say to one child, you know, the example of the Scrabble that we saw earlier, there has to be one word in one language, then the second in another, then the third back to the... So they alternate the languages that they use. But when they create a mind map, you can, the teacher can say one of the branches uh, that your family branch can uh, in one in your home language and the others in language of instruction. You can sort of direct the learning. But this is the, that the, the third one is what's really, really valuable. But when, they, when they're able to use lang all the language repertoire that they have, to engage with a challenge. So this is really, um, the one on the left is really fascinating. The, it's, it's, a, it's one of my favorite math challenges where you have to represent a number with a word, but you're only allowed to use the number of letters of that number in the word, and it has to mean that number. So you're only allowed one word to represent one, that's A. B, uh, you're only allowed two letters to represent two, by, try, and so. But this child to represent five knew Spanish and knew cinco, which has got five letters means five. So it's just incredible, isn't it, how that is inside the children and just enabling it to come out in normal circumstances of the teaching and learning process is really exciting. And then a child, another child again, who went to Peru um, when they were creating their own menus, then uh, use the, the culture that they uh, had acquired when they lived in Peru for a couple of years to present uh, her menu completely bilingually in Spanish and English. Not told to, but just chose to. Um, so what I want to just end up with is to say that these four are very important, but they have to be taught. One of the main things that I realized when developing the Jive Not Know approach is that you can't expect all these things to be happening it's sort of through osmosis. And so I developed the idea of actually teaching the children how to learn effectively through the idea of having or devoting a learning to learn week to launch the academic year. And this is really interesting to try and try uh, to, to be experimented across all phases of education. And at Sussex as well, we, you know, we are 
really building up on this model on the, as part of the induction week that the, the students have. So the idea is that you equip them with everything they need before they start learning so that then during the learning process, they have everything that they need to be able to succeed and to thrive as learners. Um, so um, it's very, very, very special. But as we saw the quote at the beginning, there's nothing more special than seeing then something like this, um, which is how I wanted to sort of end and then take any questions or any uh, comments. This is a child in Spain. We've been doing some work with some Spanish teachers um, through uh, the University of Sussex. And a teacher uh, has uh, incorporated the, the junk approach within her class and then sent me this that one of her children produced. And I can't think of anything more special. Um, he's drawn himself with a friend. So uh, Cornel, when you were there, you were very much on your own. Um, so this is a friend feels safe to be inside in that, in the pit. They're both smiling. So if you think about the the impact of all of this in terms of emotional well-being, they're both smiling in the pit. It says "No lo sé, I don't know," and they are. Um, and then he also calls it uh, instead of the learning pit. He calls it "El ocho de la felicidad," the pit of happiness. So. You know, it's just, it's not a pit of worry, it's not a pit of anxiety, it's not a pit of, it's a pit of happiness um, for him. So I thought that would be a, a really wonderful way to um, to summarise, to end um, uh, the hour and a half, couple of hours we've had together. And um, I would be delighted to take any questions, any comments, any thoughts, any ideas. Um, because the, the lovely thing about all this is it, it keeps, it just, the, the mold just keeps changing and evolving through the eye, through everyone's ideas. So um, please feel free. We've got, um, I don't know if we can stay here. For, yeah, yeah. yeah, there's nothing going on. Oh, good. Okay. So we've got plenty of time if you have to, um, to go into further discussion. Thank you all so much for being such a wonderful audience. I hope that you found some of these provocations, um, which are very counterintuitive to uh, education, an interesting, thought-provoking process. Thank you, Simonon. Thank you so much, Katrina. I have a question while uh, other people gather their thoughts online. Um, in terms of, because I'm really interested in this building in uh, creating an environment of fostering not knowing. Mm -hmm. and, and I mean, like both beyond the classroom for like people that we work with in teams or. Yes, yes, it goes beyond. Yes. Uh, and that's tricky. I find that tricky, like at least within how we run the Think Lab. Mm -hmm. um, I like to say it's like there really aren't any bad questions or, you yes. know, like bad ideas, like let's talk through them. Yes. Um, but it's still hard. I think people like it's kind of instilled really from classroom age in terms of like, exactly. does anyone have any ideas or questions? And then we all do the same thing. And it's like. It's sort of like, you know, it's like, no, but I, I want to hear, like, I know you're thinking something. So yes. we try to create a safe environment to exactly. have people do that. But it's challenging. The old Exactly, Tyler. Oh, you so. you are so perceptive. This is exactly what's, you know, what's needed yeah. to, to change that, um, th that dynamic. But I think if we change that right from the beginning, right from when <clears throat> there's zero children, then they will grow up with... You know, it's, it's, a, it's how it's the formation. Um, if I think back to my primary school um, in, in Buenos Aires, I, all I remember is fear. All I remember is being asked to go to the front and recite the times tables or recite um, a historical event. Or, you know, it's just, I, I guess, in creating this, what I want to do is exactly the opposite. Um, but what you're describing, Tyler, is what's what I kind of term a community of inquiry, where everyone feels safe to ask, to postulate, to theorize without feeling of that feeling of being judged uh, or, or the feeling that someone's got more knowledge than others. You know, it's a kind that kind of community of inquiry then leading to a combined 
um, thought process. And what what I find really amazing is that through all of this, I think one of the biggest, biggest impacts that it has is that it enables children from very early on to view and respect different points of views. So um, at the end of a lot of our philosophical discussions, some a lot of the children say, oh, this has been amazing. Before we started, I thought this, but now I think this because of what someone else said. And if we can build that way of being, you know, that, that sense of uh, always being open to other people's views and other people's thoughts and being open to um, not always thinking that what we've always thought is correct. It's fascinating, isn't it? The, the, um, I remember the Vice Chancellor of Sussex was saying that the most dangerous thing is for people to be certain, which is really fascinating, isn't it? The, the people that are not prepared to, you know, don't have that kind of open-mindedness to other ideas. Was he sure about that statement, though? <laughs> Sorry, I can't see the questions. Um, if the computer just died, I hope the, uh, oops, I'll take a look at the comments and keep an eye on them. Um, I'm just going to exit out of this if you don't mind. Oh, it's coming from this one. Oh. Are, uh, any questions or comments for anyone that's still here? Sorry, my computer died, so I can't see everyone's chat. So feel free to raise your hand uh, if you've got anything. Uh, you'd like to share with Marcella. Be lovely to hear your voices. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to plug in my computer and then see if I can see anything. Anything else here in the room? We can kind of. It's so wonderful to see um, <clears throat> people in the audience who have been really quite influential in the development of all this. Um, Simonon is absolutely amazing. He's got his own philosophy of education, all based on humanity, which has taught me so much. Um, and Andy Smart has been incredibly influential in enabling me to share all this with the wonderful people of Uzbekistan. So um, it's so great to see you both on here. A question, Andy. Yes, please. Yes. Okay. Hi, Marcelo. Fascinating to hear you in action. Are you okay? Are you? No. Yeah. Oh, yes, that's perfect. Yes. I'm sorry about that. It's that's great perfect. to see you, Marcelo. Great to see you in action. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's, it is fascinating. So here's a, my question. It really comes down to the way people talk about knowledge, because that's such a, you know, yes. contentious word in itself, you know, mm -hmm. going back for, for years, actually, but particularly under the current uh, policy environment in, in this country. Mm. Um, but it's, this is kind of a philosophical question to you, really, is if, if the position of not knowing is where you're starting from mm. and you address that, Mm. Uh, as your uh, as your basis for for exploration mm. of the the idea of knowledge, mm. how is it that you don't move from not knowing to knowing? Because in uh, the model you presented, it goes from not knowing to understanding, as if as if knowing is somehow so knowing to me that the the word the concept of knowing there is is shifting shape a little bit. <laughs> And I sense that it's almost like the way that the old Bloom's taxonomy got got twisted over the years, because, you know, when he started out, he put knowledge of the, as the sort of as this sort of base level of, of, of understanding. And then when the new form of Bloom's taxonomy emerged, I think by those who inherited it and, and worked with it as uh, who were his students, the idea of knowledge became an end in itself rather than the, the sort of kind of you know discrete facts that you might have at the start of your learning journey so 
that that that's a, that's an int- I mean, it's just kind of um, an intellectual challenge to you. Yes, I love your intellectual challenges, uh, Andy. I think what what comes to mind, um, and it's, it's, it's so much insight in in how you think, um, and it is that I. I have I place the beginning. Although I, you're saying that the the person places themselves at the beginning in a position of not knowing, they're there with a huge amount of knowledge. Yes. Yeah, so so what the only not knowing bit is the is what they're going to learn next. But they come, they, they realize, this is why the, the, sort of the whole thing around experts of learning, they realize that they already have a lot of knowledge that they're building on to then, and, and skills, to then be able to move, to acquire more, to sort of make, build a wall a bit higher. But the new bricks are the ones that, that they, they are, they're acquiring new knowledge of. But the, no, the brick of no, the, the wall of knowledge keeps building and building. And when, when they get to the other side, what's really interesting is that they, they do have more knowledge when they come to the side, like Cornell had more knowledge of where I was born. But then what's really interesting with, with children is that, or with any learner, is that realizing that new knowledge it's not an end in itself, but it's, it's a way of that prompting more wanting to know more. So knowledge, knowledge underpins everything, but I, I, I wanted to use the, the kind of the provocation of the enjoying of not knowing as a way of saying, how, you know, how do we move forwards with acquiring knowledge? And how do we move forward? You know, how we how we do we move away from just being content with what we already know? And how do we have that thirst for always wanting to uh, find that more? But it's really fascinating, Andy, because when um, I always say to the students and to the children, when when you realise that you don't know something, you have a choice. You can either want to know it, or you're not interested in knowing it. Yeah, so you might know that there's lots of things you don't know, but it doesn't mean that you have that you will want to know everything you don't know. So we have a we have a choice, and I think particularly in a school scenario, um, shifting the balance of wanting to know what we know we don't know for the majority of the time is really beneficial. Um, and I, I think that sometimes um, a lot of students know that they don't know something and either they don't want to know it or they don't feel skilled to be able to thrive whilst they're getting to know it. So they don't start knowing it in the, they don't start engaging in the first place. So it's removing those barriers. But um, I think it's really, it, it's really interesting. But but knowledge underpins underpins it all. It's just how we it's just how we view the acquiring of more. Great, brilliant to chat. Um, probably have time for one more question, and I saw that Sue online. If you're still uh, here, hi Sue. Hello Sue. Um, you're, uh, did you want to ask her a question? I can paraphrase it. Oh, she just disappeared. I think. Um, well, anyways, the, the question was about um, uh, joy of not knowing, and could this help with imposter syndrome? Oh, uh, no, Mike. Anyways, yeah. Oh, no, Mike. Yes. Oh, so what a brilliant question. Yes, absolutely it can, because it places the teacher in the same position as the learner. So it, it, it moves this, this whole process. Do you remember when we said that about the two D shapes? Can we learn about two D shapes? Communities of inquiry is 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 all based upon developing things together. So the imposter syndrome tends to melt away when you feel you know when you are um, 
presenting the learning in a way that you're just saying we're all working on this together. So you, it goes away from that traditional, I'm the expert imparting knowledge on yourself. And the imposter syndrome then comes when you feel maybe I'm not the expert. Uh, towards saying, you know, this is something that it'd be great to explore altogether. We all bring different aspects to it. Some of us have more experience, some of, some of us have greater knowledge, greater understanding. But it's, it's the togetherness that I think um, makes the uh, imposter syndrome um, kind of dissipate uh, with this approach. That's a great question. So great, great yeah. question. Any other questions or comments? I think we can wrap up. I think that's a good positive note to end that's on. So really yes, uh, yeah. Well, thank you, Marcella, yeah. for this presentation. Very engaging. Lots of thought-provoking questions. So thank you for joining us in person. Thank you, everyone, for joining us online. So. Uh, we appreciate it, and um, I think uh, I think we'll wrap up. This recording will be available for anyone, so please feel free to share this afterwards. And have a nice uh, February fourteenth, everyone. And can we yes. just say, Tal, if anybody um, anybody that has joined today that uh, hasn't got the a signed copy of the book, I'd be oh yes, yeah, <laughs> we've got copies right here in front of us. Uh, I would be delighted if you send me an email to. Um, to make that uh, that happen for you. Yeah, that's very kind. <laughs> <laughs>